This interview is with Robert John Walfelt for the Veterans History Project. Mr. Walfelt was in the U.S. Navy from July 19, 1943 to May 10, 1946. He served as an EM-3C, an electrical mate third class, on the destroyer the USS Waldron in the Pacific. Today is Wednesday, October 17. My name is Harriet Williamson. The uh, videographer and director of lighting and sound is Henry Radcliffe. Also in the studio is Mr. Waldfelt's daughter, Jan Cruz. We are in the television studio of WILL on the campus of the University of Illinois in Urbana. Mr. Waldfelt, could you please um, begin by maybe talking a little bit about when and where you were born and a little bit about your family and your education? Um, I was born in Danville, Illinois on June 7th in 1925. My uh, uh, parents were of uh, Prussian, German Prussian extract. Uh, we went to uh, grade school at uh, a parochial school, the, uh, a, the Manuel Lutheran School in Germantown. Uh, my folks lived in Germantown most of their life. Uh, we, uh, my dad, uh, uh, was a blacksmith in, uh, on the CNEI Railroad where I worked for some time. I went to uh, parochial school system, uh, went to Danville High School, uh, joined the Navy before I graduated from the high school. Now, because your folks were of a German background, did that affect anything about their lives at the beginning of the war? Well, the church I went to uh, uh, they made them quit having services in the German language because of the uh, uh, the preacher uh, Berthal uh, was a uh, uh, had been from Germany and he they of course you know all the scare about uh, uh, people who are from other countries and that and when you're at war and at odds with them why they always expect the worst or mm -hmm. suspect the worst. Well, that's re pretty significant to uh, end a language in a church. Did, were there any other effects on your family? No, we were pretty much uh, uh, community people. My, mm -hmm. my folks, my dad had played baseball, played in the bands, and was a union organizer. Uh, my mother worked uh, in the church a lot. She uh, also uh, was an active bowler. Uh, in fact, at one time she even went to Cuba. That was when we were still on friendly terms mm -hmm. with them. Uh, otherwise, we were just like every other community people. We did our thing, went to school, and, uh, lived in the neighborhood. And uh, I was a Cardinal fan. My mother was a Cub fan. <laughs> uh, and how did you come to enlist in the Navy? Well, I was uh, going to high school and also working at that time. Uh, I had just gotten a job uh, uh, on uh, the Sinai Railroad uh, as uh, a young uh, laborer in order to help make some money to uh, help with my schooling. And the uh, uh, come vacation time, I went to South Dakota to uh, visit with my, working on the railroad, my dad had a, we had free passes to uh, uh, anywhere in the country uh, two times a year. And I had gone to South Dakota to uh, visit my uncle who had a sheep ranch. And uh, while I was there is when the uh, war broke out. And uh, uh, we talked about it, I stayed there, uh, became acquainted at that time with some Lakota Sioux Indians and be fell in love with them. Uh, went back to uh, Illinois, uh, went back to school, and uh, they were talking about draft. In that time they had the draft was in vogue. Uh, were drafting people right and left, and I decided I did not want to pray through mud and rain and water. I decided I would rather ride. So I went down and uh, uh, volunteered for induction into the Navy, mm -hmm. and that's how it came about. Well, let's see, Illinois is a landlocked <laughs> <laughs> state, so I was just curious as to how you had chosen the Navy, and you answered that question. Uh, 
when when you began your training, where did you go first? Well, they uh, uh, shipped us to uh, uh, an induction center in Chicago. Uh, we were there maybe three or four hours, and they loaded us on trains and sent us to uh, uh, to uh, uh, Portland, Ar Portland, uh, Idaho, to the uh, naval base that had just opened there. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we're in a landlocked area, but you're at a naval base in Idaho, so you're still not on the water yet. Is that correct? That's correct. The uh, uh, after boot camp, uh, they uh, sent me to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and in, uh, it was called NOB, uh, Virginia, and there they made the assignments. Uh, while I was there, uh, my dad was also a horseshoe pitcher, <laughs> a pretty good one, and uh, so while we were there, we set up horseshoe courts at the uh, training base, and uh, uh, waited around there for a while and then was assigned to a new construction destroyer service and I was assigned to the uh, Waldron. Mm -hmm. They had a, in this uh, Norfolk, they had one section of the camp set up for Waldron uh, and people that had been assigned to it. Uh, the ship hadn't been uh, well enough uh, along to send anybody there. And then on uh, June 19, uh, uh, 44, they sent us to uh, uh, Kearney, New Jersey, and we went aboard the ship and sort of helped uh, uh, get it ready for the uh, commissioning in that. Mm -hmm. Can I back up for just a minute and just ask you a little bit about your training in Farragut, that, I mean at the Farragut Naval Base, that, that was boot camp for the Navy? That's right. Mm -hmm. It was made up of about six camps. Uh, during that time, we went through not only the training, but also uh, they picked out people for future assignments. They had uh, 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 tests in the uh, pool sections and that to uh, train for. Uh, they wanted to know if they had any lifesavers, and all you had to do was dive in and uh, uh, pull somebody along the water and you were a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. I had been lucky enough when I was still in high school, uh, they used to have, we used to swim in Lake Vermilion a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a lot of, uh, and there was no fairgrounds in Danville and they had a lot of swimming uh, uh, schedules and that. And I used to win the backstroke. I got pretty good at that so I had a lot of uh, experience in swimming backstroke and that's what helped me then mm -hmm. in boot camp. Mm -hmm. So they put me on as a lifeguard. <laughs> now what other kind of training did you have? When well you I had uh, been a machinist uh, uh, training at the uh, Sinai Railroad. When I, uh, they were the old steam engines. Uh, before that I worked on a section down in Clinton, Indiana. Uh, worked as a um, labor on the section crew laying track and mm -hmm. Uh, young high school boys then were pretty much in demand because they were strong and didn't ask a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same reason the, the Army and Navy wanted them. Mm -hmm. Now when did you become an electrical mate? Was there any kind of special training for that? Well, my dad uh, also had a radio shop and did uh, radio uh, or did electrical wiring uh, for uh, uh, people uh, in Danville and I used to go along as a helper. Uh, that, so I had a lot of experience in uh, the nomenclature. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew a lot about it, even though I did uh, have the experience of actually laying hands on. Mm -hmm. Now, did the Navy give you any special training for? Well, uh, when uh, because of the answers you give on your questionnaires, they sent me to uh, Purdue University as a naval training, it was an electrical training institution for uh, for the Navy. Uh, I went through uh, one of their companies. Uh, we did uh, lab work and battery work, things that pertain to uh, Navy style uh, electrical work. Mm -hmm. Now, back uh, at Kearney, New Jersey, when you went aboard the USS Waldron, uh, was there kind of a shakeout period then for that ship, and what well, did that the, involve? Well, uh, the ship, uh, we actually uh, uh, got pretty well acquainted with it, and 
and that's where we got our name. Our, our ship, although it was the Waldron, uh, got the name as the Bloody W. <laughs> While we were in uh, dock there uh, finishing up uh, some of the uh, uh, racks for the uh, depth charge racks, uh, one of them fell and uh, actually killed a couple workers there, and mm -hmm. our, our deck was flooded with blood. and. Uh, and such a mess, and it sort of scared a lot of the guys that had just come aboard. They mm -hmm. uh, didn't know what to think of that, but uh, uh, we managed to get through it, uh, got the ship underway, uh, I went to, headed for Bermuda, and mm -hmm. on the way to Bermuda, somebody threw a, a pair of pants in one of the reduction gears, so we had to go back for repairs. Uh, we got back, and uh, that was when the Bermuda Triangle was getting its name, too, you know. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we, had, in fact, then on the next trip to Bermuda, some of the, one of the ships in our uh, task group got lost uh, in heavy seas. There was a big storm. So all the things that happened to scare a person mm -hmm. out and wonder if they made the right decision, if maybe mm -hmm. the muddy fields wouldn't have been better, uh, come to mind. Well, but we went back to... Uh, uh, Chicago and had a uh, uh, the last ship's party and then headed for uh, the Panama Canal through Delaware and the Panama Canal. Were you able to see your family when you went back to Chicago? Well, they gave us a few days off uh, when we come back from Bermuda. Uh, another friend aboard the ship went home with me. We were there probably uh, five or six days and then back to the ship. Mm -hmm. What was it like to return to civilian life for a few days? Well, you was, uh, it, it really was uh, kind of strange. Your room looked bare. It didn't look the same. It didn't have the same uh, excitement that it had when you mm -hmm. left. Uh, you really were anxious to get back to the ship and get under the, uh, uh, the regula regulations and that to be organized uh, to know what you were doing. Mm. That's interesting. Um, What was life like on a destroyer? Maybe you could just talk about your first impressions well, of the, the ship when you, uh, when you first went aboard. Uh, I, I had had kind of a, a bad impression of the Navy while I was in boot camp, and I, uh, I'm going to bring this up so that uh, my first experiences really uh, were downers. I, mm -hmm. uh, the first night of, uh, in boot camp, I put my bill full under my pillow and somebody stole it. <laughs> Lost all the pictures from uh, South Dakota, which mm. were my favorite. Oh. And uh, so uh, I, I really was pretty, but then when we went aboard ship and when we went to Norfolk, uh, uh, the uh, training in that we got there was uh, fire training, things like that, that would help us in case we needed to board the ship. Uh, Met some new friends and mm -hmm. uh, got excited about uh, uh, two of them, became lifelong friends. And in mm -hmm. fact, I'm still uh, very well acquainted with uh, one of them has passed away. The other one lives in Dallas, Texas, and uh, uh, we still correspond. And then I have one of the very good friend in San Diego who uh, stayed in the Navy for 30 mm -hmm. years, in fact. Uh, but uh, board ship. Uh, uh, we were assigned compartments. Uh, uh, I was in engineering, and so we were close to the electrical shop uh, so we could move in and out of it. Uh, uh, the ship was sort of divided up. Uh, seamen were in one, the, uh, uh, the uh, people that were in dietetics and that were in another, just depending on where you were and how close to your work. They kept mm -hmm. you close to where you had to go. Mm -hmm. Now, I was assigned uh, uh, aboard ship special, regu uh, special duties. One of them was the sound-powered telephones. We what had, does that mean? Well, a sound-powered phone uh, is one that has the, uh, uh, the magnets and that in it that the sound of your voice vibrates the vibrator and it makes, carries a sound so you don't need electricity or any uh, mm -hmm. uh, thing like that to uh, Take, send your voice through the wires and that it was all done by the uh, power of your voice on the magnet, mm -hmm. vibration of the magnets. And uh, so that was one of my responsibilities to look after all of them uh, on the ship. Then another responsibility was uh, 
uh, I had experience on uh, um, generator sets and uh, so I watched the main distribution board was my main watch. I was on four, off four, on four every night. Uh, that was during regular sea duty. Mm -hmm. uh, during battle station times I was assigned to a, uh, at first to a uh, quad 40 which is a, f a four barrel uh, 40 millimeter uh, gun. Uh, they needed somebody with a stronger back up on one of the five inch mounts, so they moved me up there mm -hmm. uh, putting projectiles on a ready rack, which was a 54 pound projectile that you took out of a hoist and set up on the rack, which shoved it into the uh, gun mount. Uh, uh, we had uh, three twin five inch gun mounts, and each one had their own loaders and that. So I was on one side of a, of a, th of a five inch gun mount. Mm -hmm. Now, I talk with my hands, I know. The, um, those guns, how rapidly did they fire? Well, they were all fired through a gun director on the bridge. Uh, they uh, would, uh, uh, we fired the, our particular mount, this uh, number two gun mount, uh, fired so rapidly during one of the kamikaze attacks that it uh, warped the barrel. They had to change the barrel on it. Is that easily done to change the barrel? Well, it's a it's a good chore. They have they uh, screw in and are fastened in. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not too well acquainted. I was an electrician. That was mm -hmm. handled by the uh, uh, people who were responsible for the gunner's mates. They took care of things like that. Now, do you, did you have any health issues as a result of being involved in firing of those guns, like with your back or anything else? During the war? Mm -hmm. No, I had no problems. I was uh, 17, 18 years old and in very mm -hmm. good health. Had worked on the, on the railroad uh, as a gandy dancer. Uh, was in very good uh, health. Mm -hmm. Did you have any problems with seasickness? Never. I never had a, never once was seasick, though we had people aboard the ship who carried uh, buckets with them and always had a piece of bread in their bucket. <laughs> but I had no problems with it. So going back to your schedule then, not during combat, but on a normal day at sea. Um, we were all assigned uh, uh, responsibilities to uh, uh, we had uh, a pretty good electrical gang. We had a chief electrician, uh, had uh, several first class, second class, third class, and strikers. At the time I was went into the shop, I was uh, a electrician striker, a fireman first class. Mm -hmm. uh, when I made uh, rank, uh, one of my first responsibilities was making sure all the connections on a uh, electrical board was tight. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you uh, would have to count your tools and uh, take the covers all off and make sure that uh, everything was tight and then count your tools before you locked it up again. Uh, at that time I had a uh, apprentice fireman with me. Uh, his name was Calvin Reed. And uh, uh, when we were tightening up the uh, the board, I asked Calvin, I said, well, now, you didn't go get any extra tools, did you? And he said, oh, yeah, I went down and got a suicide screwdriver so I could put a wrench on it. And a suicide screwdriver is one that has a metal side so that you could put a wrench on it and tighten it. Mm. So I said, well, wh where is it? We have to add a count and a checkoff list. Mm -hmm. and so I had to look around. There it laid between the bus bar <laughs> on the electric board. He had left it. Oh, my goodness. Had we tightened it up and put it online, it would have uh, really knocked it off. So mm -hmm. uh, it shows the importance of keeping track of your yeah, tools. Yeah, it sounds like in surgery where you keep track of. Mm -hmm. So I should have put him on report, but it was his first time. So he and I, he became a lifelong friend. <laughs> <laughs> now, you uh, had said that you were you went through this, the uh, Panama Canal. When your ship was going through the canal, were you allowed to have any leave at that point? Oh in time? yes, we made several leaves. In uh, uh, I can remember the name of one of the streets, but I can't remember the towns. In fact, we were in one of the uh, uh, the 
the engineers on destroyers had a bad reputation to keep. And mm -hmm. while we were in Panama going out to the Pacific, uh, we went to a nightclub and uh, of course, being a tough sailor, <laughs> we mm -hmm. all fought. Uh, we got into a hassle with uh, uh, the uh, people in the bar and they ended up locking us up in an old building mm -hmm. and uh, there was enough engineers in there they couldn't, they needed us on the ship. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the captain had to come and get us out, but uh, he told us no liberty for a couple weeks. <laughs> now, were you with a convoy of ships? Going yes, there was the... a... Uh, a uh, convoy of destroyers, there was probably, uh, we were the 699 and uh, it was the 698 through probably the 700 and I can't remember the names, Hames Works, Ames, a lot mm -hmm. of those ships were mm -hmm. uh, in this destroyer group that had just been commissioned in New York or in uh, uh, New Jersey. Uh, at the same time, the uh, Missouri, which was the biggest battle wagon, our new battle wagon, was also launched around the same time and uh, commissioned. Uh, and it also entered the uh, uh, Pacific at the same time mm -hmm. we did. How long would it take to go through the canal with a big oh, group It took like us that? probably uh, a couple of days. The, mm -hmm. There's a, uh, a lock system. You go in and they bring the water up or let it down whichever mm -hmm. way you're going and uh, uh, you end up in the, at the sea level on the other mm -hmm. side. Did you have um, maybe a little more confidence because you were on a brand new ship and, and perhaps it had more up-to-date equipment? Than no, I, uh, we were all kind of uh, wondering what would go wrong next mm -hmm. because being a new ship, nothing had really, we went on what they called a shakedown ship mm -hmm. uh, cruise before uh, Panama and back, which doesn't very uh, mm -hmm. much of a distance. And then uh, uh, after we went through the canal, we went into uh, San Diego and from there on to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. When you, you uh, went from the Atlantic to the Pacific, did you see a, a difference in those two oceans in terms of the way the ship rode? Or? Not really. Uh, 17 year old sailor uh, still going to high school don't mm -hmm. even think about things like that <laughs> about all I was interested in is doing my job and mm -hmm. uh, once in Hawaii then was that the beginning of being sent into combat yes we uh, and there was another big disappointment there you know in uh, uh, well it wasn't in Hawaii it was the uh, uh, we got what they, we'd go out and practice, practice shooting at targets, flying over mm -hmm. with uh, plane targets. And uh, uh, we also had 10 torpedoes on our ship and we practiced launching them also. Mm -hmm. And uh, dropping depth charges, uh, the whole gamut of uh, uh, things you do in, a, in combat. Uh, after they thought we were good enough, especially the firing at the sleeves was our main uh, uh, practice. Uh, they they didn't give you too much time for recreation and uh, play. We, they was anxious to get us out in the fleet because mm -hmm. that was the right and, uh, when things was going pretty tough there. Mm -hmm. What now? Let's let's talk about the date and get that set. So you're in Hawaii, and is it around 1944? Are we talking? Yes. About? Uh, the uh, oh, uh, uh, when I was in Danville. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, a, a garage where I'd bought my first car oh. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the son of that man while we was in Hawaii, here come a guy along on a motorcycle <laughs> and it was him. Oh my goodness. He, he uh, slid off onto off of the road and he stopped and we helped him get it up and found out who he was <laughs> and I've forgotten his name. But, uh, did you see him after the war? No, never saw him again after mm -hmm. that, but I did see his brother, worked with his brother in Danville, but I've forgotten their name. Mm. <laughs> it's, that was quite a few years ago, but uh, that was what they called R&R. &R. Uh, I remember seeing people out in the water with uh, nets catching fish, things like that. We didn't have too much time to mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, get acquainted with very many people there. Or, or they were anxious to get us on the way. W were you receiving mail from back home at this point in time? Uh, spottedly, we they we we got mail. Yes, uh, at that time, uh, uh, my girlfriend had left. Uh, Danville and went to Chicago uh, to work for a doctor uh, to babysit for him, and uh, uh, that was about all. The... Mm -hmm. So you kept up a steady correspondence. Right. Yes, with we did. Mm -hmm. That was that, and my parents and, and sisters were about the only ones I would write to. And then again, uh, you just don't. Uh, I didn't do too much writing. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you did you keep a diary? I kept one on uh, aboard the ship, a one-line diary. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, whenever I could think about it, I had a little black book, and I'd write each day what mm -hmm. was happening. And uh, uh, later on, I uh, copied it off. Interesting. Um, you're in Hawaii, and it's 1944. Do we? What what month are we talking about now? Is this oh, around? Gosh, I don't. Uh, um, Well, we left, it was uh, in October of 44, we went through the canal and we went to San Pedro and, uh, oh, we arrived in Pearl Harbor on October the 20th. And that's where we had two months of that mm -hmm. aircraft training. Was that uh, significant for you all to be in Pearl Harbor, given that that was the beginning of well, the war with Japan? Well, we didn't get much around where the ships and that had been damaged and mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, we were mostly out and at sea uh, mm -hmm. training uh, and then we left Pearl Harbor and went to a little place called Anawitak Atoll and we got there it was on Christmas Day I remember in 1944. And were you able to go ashore there? Well no well, they gave us uh, uh, five cans of beer and put us on the whole <laughs> island and told us that if anybody got sunburnt they was going to be court-martialed. <laughs> they wanted to keep us healthy. <laughs> Where was your next port of call? Well, that was a, a Lithia toll, and uh, uh, we left there and was actually assigned to uh, Task Force 38 from there. Now, I've read about Task Force 58, but I'm not clear. What is Task Force 38? Task Force 58 is five units of mm -hmm. groups of ships. Uh, when two of them go in for R&R, uh, &R, then it becomes 38, uh -huh. and that was the uh, smaller unit of Task mm -hmm. Force 58. It was usually commanded Halsey and uh, Spruance were the uh, uh, admirals and that in charge of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, task group. Now, for on a day-to-day -day basis, would you know where you were and? No, no. we had no idea uh -huh. uh, where we were. It was, but we did get some pretty nice music from. Uh, a uh, station that they'd picked up with a lady called Tokyo Rose. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to listen to her? She was very good. She had all the latest music, though they would uh, go through the garbage the ships threw out and get the names off of envelopes and things, and uh, that's why we were had to be very careful about what we put in the garbage uh -huh. that they threw over the side. Uh -huh. And uh, she would announce the names of their so-and-so's mother missed you, she wished you was home, and things like that. Oh my goodness. It's... We would hear things like that. Uh, was that disturbing when you would hear no, things like you, that? No, it was a big joke aboard <laughs> the ship. <laughs> we just wanted to hear her music. That was mm -hmm. the only way we got to hear the latest music. Mm -hmm. um, when, what was your first combat experience? Where was that? Well, uh, Combat is more than just planes and things firing on you. We actually went to places like Formosa, South mm -hmm. China. Uh, we would go and fire. The planes would drop bombs. We would go up and fire from uh, uh, the larger mounts and that. Uh, we, our ship was called a picket or escort ship. We looked after the carriers. We uh, operated at a distance from the uh, fleet in order to, uh, we had some of the first radar at that time. Radar uh, had just uh, become available for the sea 
-hmm. for the ships at sea, and we were one of the first ships with it. And uh, so we would go out and spot and keep track of what was going on. They had these destroyers stationed around the fleet, outside of the fleet. We were called the dispersibles. And uh, they, uh, uh, we would be relieved every once in a while. Another ship would come out and relieve us. Sometimes you'd go to relieve a ship, it wouldn't be there. And sometimes the ship never showed up to relieve mm. you. So mm. uh, things like that happened. When you would be relieved, then what would your ship we do? We would go back into the squadron. We were assigned to a certain area in mm -hmm. the uh, group, and that's where we would go. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, did the life on board the ship then change when you were in? Uh, no, it was pretty much the same. Uh, when we were out on picket duty and that, we uh, were always on the alert. We had uh, uh, duty uh, on the uh, uh, spotting duty, they called it. We had to always be on the lookout for mm -hmm. the planes and that on horizon or ships or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, besides, they had the radar going to and uh, uh, we also had uh, uh, sound gear. Uh, we were always looking for submarines. Uh, mm -hmm. Our ship was kind of a sub chaser too. And one of my responsibilities, they had a big paravane that went down through the bottom that had a sounding device that would, it was called a ping uh, transmitter, would send a signal and if it hit a uh, uh, another object, it would send back a different signal, mm -hmm. and I, one of my responsibilities was to keep that thing polished up all the time. Mm -hmm. I used to go down a lot of times and uh, just pull it up and polish it and stick it back down through the system. Mm -hmm. It was sort of like an underwater antenna. Did you encounter, you know, in picket duty, did you also encounter any marine life that was significant, like whales? Well, we would see, uh, once in a while, we would see porpoise. Uh, we'd see a whale, and very seldom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we were on the move most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't stand still. We were, our top speed was around 35 or 6 knots, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, even though it wasn't listed as that fast, but we, we always claimed we went 36, but we were always on the move. We didn't have a chance to uh, to see much thing, much mm -hmm. marine life. Or Where are some of the other sites that you were in the Pacific? Well, uh, Formosa, which is uh, uh, the uh, Japanese or the Chinese uh, uh, off the mainland of uh, of China. And we were in French Indochina, which is now Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, we just uh, uh, would uh, travel in. They'd let the planes loose. They they would break us up into groups, and we would uh, uh, stay with that particular group of carriers and that while they launched planes to had certain areas to attack. Mm -hmm. And we were there to pick up pilots and that when they come back, if they didn't make a landing or if they had to ditch their planes, we mm -hmm. were there to pick them up. How, how was that accomplished? Well, we had a motor whale boat uh, whenever, well, on several occasions when a pilot was shot down. In fact, there was one time a pilot uh, we picked up twice. Uh, the same pilot, but on different days. And, uh, and it's amazing, you never hear about a pilot that uh, has gone out that had been shot down. But uh, we would uh, uh, spot them in the water. We'd get a location, you know, the plane cap from the carriers would give us a location and we'd go to that location. And uh, they would usually either be in a raft or they would have a uh, 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 some dye material that they would throw in the water and it'd leave mm -hmm. a big ring, we'd know where they were. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the choppy seas and that, it was almost impossible to see it, but we would go out in the motor, we'd get close as we could to them, mm -hmm. and we'd get in the motor whale boat and uh, go out to as close as we could mm -hmm. and <clears throat> dive off the motor whale boat and grab them, they'd pull us back on the boat. Oh and, my goodness, uh, so you'd be in the water with them? Yeah, sometimes. You wonder why you, <laughs> you ever volunteered. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty chopping sometimes. You, it was hard, pretty hard to swim in it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty tiring. They grease you up. We had a uh, uh, plastic uh, 
harness light or a canvas harness that would strap around you and then had a ring on it and they'd put a 3 8 line in it. And, and a, a motor whale boat would have an engineer who would run the engine, had a boats and mate and a couple other people that would be uh, able to uh, navigate, know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would sail out to uh, as close as we could, dive in, grab them, and then take them back to the ship. When you get back to the ship, they had plenty of help on the sides to pull them up and mm -hmm. uh, give them first aid, and then we'd take them to a hospital ship. Mm -hmm. um, was the destroyer pretty self sufficient in terms of supplies, or did it have to well, be resupplied? Well, we would, uh, we would uh, uh, usually take on supplies and oil. We refueled at sea many a time. We'd mm -hmm. have these big. Uh, uh, oil lines that we would throw a line over to a, uh, most of the time it would be like a carry or a uh, battleship or a cruiser we'd throw a line over to them and mm -hmm. then finally pull an oil line over and uh, fill our fuel tanks with it. Mm -hmm. the, uh, 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 there were times those lines would break and people would get hurt. And one of my responsibilities there, again, was the sound power phones. Whenever they uh, sent the lines over to the other ship, I also had to send over a uh, sound power phone mm -hmm. so that we could communicate between mm -hmm. the two ships. Mm -hmm. A lot of responsibilities. And <laughs> sometimes the rough water, it was pretty difficult to, to get those things done, but we always managed to do it. Were there any times that you were in terrible storms? Oh, plenty of times. Uh, one of the worst ones was when we, at one time, they decided uh, that you, you probably remember uh, reading about Shangri-La when the uh, uh, bombers, they wondered where they came from and they told them Shangri-La. Well, we pulled a trick. We uh, were off between Japan and uh, we went up into the China Sea. There was a strait up there called the Ballantine Strait. And uh, our ship, a couple other destroyers, and a small, what they called a small aircraft carrier, uh, sailed in after, under darkness to uh, attack Japan from the backside. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is only a recollection I may have. <laughs> half of it's been a lot of years ago, too. But we went into the, and while we were there, one of the worst storms. Uh, uh, our ship took a 48 degree roll, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a, uh, a pretty good swipe. I don't remember now, but I think it's in the 30s. If they roll 30, you don't straighten up again. Mm -hmm. So we uh, had to strap ourselves in that at night in our bunks uh, while we were up in there. But uh, we lost ships. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, when we were up in the China Sea, they told us to uh, to uh, get rid of our ballast because they wanted to be able to hurry out. Well, our skipper was an old timer who had lost a couple ships mm. in battle up in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was George Peckham. And uh, he wouldn't uh, release his ballast, he kept it. And mm -hmm. we managed through the, uh, uh, he knew how to get through the, in the troughs and that mm -hmm. uh, keep us from uh, having too much damage. But, also, when we were at uh, uh, Okinawa, there was a big storm there. Uh, they're pretty vicious storms. A hurricane, you can see what happened to uh, Louisiana and mm -hmm. uh, Florida. Well, imagine being out in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I can't, really. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, and it's, uh, you just hope for the best. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk at all about any further combat experiences? Well, the, uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, towards the end, there when uh, we were at Okinawa, uh, the sky looked like it was full of black mosquitoes. The kamikaze planes were thicker than anything you've ever seen. I can remember, too, one time watching a projectile from the Missouri. We were firing on the uh, uh, airfield there at Okinawa and the Missouri was standing off and it shot a 16-inch projectile and it just looked like a Volkswagen going through the sky. 
those were pretty good size. Mm -hmm. uh, did any kamikaze uh, pilots come well, endangering the Waldron? No, we didn't. We didn't get hit. Several of our sister ships did. Uh, I saw one land uh, in the water beside the ship, and saw the wheels pop up. But oh. and the only reason I got to see it, we had had a hung fire. Uh, one of them, when the director of the ship sets the projectiles in the gun mounts, they have a fuse on them that it sets so that they fire at certain distance. And uh, uh, one of them got stuck, we couldn't set it back to zero and I had to throw it over the side so I had to open the door and go out on the deck and throw it over mm -hmm. and uh, that's when I happened to see the plane in the water. Mm. But outside of that, when you were inside the gun mounts, all you did was loaded the guns. Mm -hmm. You uh, uh, didn't worry too much about what was going on around you. Mm -hmm. What was your job then after the co after combat on the ship? What well, you after do? the combat, one of my responsibilities was damage repair. I would have to go through all the compartments and make sure that the lighting and everything. After all the firing and that, the lighting and that got shook pretty uh, up to pretty bad. Mm -hmm. They still had incandescents. They didn't have fluorescent lights back then, and it would shake them loose. And so, uh, during my duties of cleaning them up, uh, I discovered something that I didn't even know existed in the Navy. Uh, one of the upper uh, uh, forward compartments had. Uh, nine black men in it, and I didn't even know we had black sailors on our ship. Mm -hmm. uh, I got acquainted with them and talked to them and found out they were called steward's mates. Mm -hmm. And their responsibility was to take care of the officers. They would do their clothes, do their cooking, do their washing, uh, whatever they needed done, they were there to do it, mm -hmm. waited on. And I thought they were like slaves. I thought, mm -hmm. my land, slavery's done. We never seen these young men and they, uh, when people came out, uh, when we were sailing along and you never saw them ab aboard de above deck with mm. uh, at any time. So I don't suppose half the, or I don't even suppose that very many people on the ship knew we had black sailors even. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, got acquainted and uh, uh, made friends and uh, was, went back there many times just to talk with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they, uh, uh, after the war was over, again, I tried to get acquainted. Well, getting back to uh, uh, when we left Okinawa after the uh, landings at Okinawa, uh, and we went back to uh, the signing for the peace accord. We mm -hmm. took all the uh, news uh, bureau chiefs back and uh, they covered the signing. Uh, then we were given duty to uh, uh, check out the islands and the occupation and make sure that reparations took place, that the people on some of the islands got back to the mainland. Mm -hmm. uh, they finally sent us back, and uh, after I got out, we had a, uh, they started a, a ship's historical uh, program called the uh, uh, Half Moon, we had a newsletter called The Half Moon, and um, we held one of our reunions for the ship in uh, Texas. Uh, but these newspaper bureau chiefs had written up uh, the, for their newspapers about the uh, people aboard the ship. Uh, well, during that conversation, I talked with one of the bureau chiefs about a story for I wanted for my hometown paper, which at that time was a commercial news. And he said, oh, we can't write that. We can't put that in. We have to go according to what the government allows us to mm -hmm. write. So that told me that there wasn't really freedom of the press. I mm -hmm. got all upset over that. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, article they did about the people in Texas uh, was because the, the uh, steward's mate was working in the wardroom and the movie operator was from Texas. And they showed special movies for those guys, so they got better acquainted, and they did an article for them in their newspaper, and that's how I got the name of this black man that uh, uh, when we had a reunion there, mm -hmm. and I called him and asked him to come to the reunion, and he said, nope. He said, uh, 
Uh, no one cared about me on a ship while I was there, so why should I care about showing up at your reunion? And that just made me say, well, I'm going to do something to justify that. And that's what really governed a lot of my life after that. I got very interested in the civil rights movement and worked hard in it. And uh, But that was the the reason for it. When you talked with those sailors, when you first met them, what did they say? What was your conversation with them? Well, they couldn't understand uh, uh, why nobody had any respect for them and why they didn't. Uh, uh, and it was an altogether different uh, atmosphere back then, too. Uh, even the uh, black men and women uh, had a different attitude about their lives then. Uh, they weren't treated as equals uh, hardly anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the 40s, uh, even though uh, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, they, uh, the black people never were really free, and they still aren't to this day. Mm -hmm. Did So it, it was really, they were totally ignored because it was only the officers who saw them? That's who, correct. So they, they had absolutely no contact with with the, the rest other. of the ship. That's mm -hmm. correct. So they were really in isolation. That is exactly right. Mm -hmm. That that's my uh, Your take. view of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come back to that. But I wanted to ask you about um, the period after the war because your ship then did stayed in. Was it in Japan? Yes, our. Uh, uh captain uh, was uh, had been in quite a few battles there and uh, uh, had lost a couple ships in uh, uh, other destroyers and I used to know the names but I've forgotten the names of them but uh, he was given the responsibility to uh, uh, repatriate uh, people from different little islands around mm -hmm. there and uh, we would take uh, army officers and... Uh, these were Japanese army no, officers? No, these were American, American. officers mm -hmm. that we would take to these little islands and they would go in and do the uh, uh, the work to repatriate and get the people, make sure they loaded up and brought them back mm -hmm. to the mainland of Japan. Did, did you bring any Japanese back to Japan? Not on our ship. Mm -hmm. they, we would be responsible, though we did uh, uh, see other Japanese ships that we would have uh, confrontations with and uh, uh, have boarding parties go on and uh, take over their ship and then make mm -hmm. sure we'd head, make, escort them back to uh, uh, an American base. Hmm. Well, you had told me that you were among the first people who had entered. Uh, that's right, in Japan, uh, a little place called Yokosuke. Uh, it had, must have been a, uh, a shipbuilding uh, port because there was this big uh, metal forming shop that I went through and it was completely, I was the only one in it. It was empty. I just went in and looked curious and walked around through it and uh, uh, even found some little innovations there that I had been working in a machine in, uh, on a railroad. Uh, had been uh, learning welding, and while I was there, I found some little things that uh, was pretty exciting I'd never seen before. That's so I got the idea about some uh, flip-up lids for your welding helmet, you know, little mm -hmm. things you could use without having to reach up and push them up all the time, mm -hmm. different things like that that I picked up and brought back with me. And that uh, shop was totally empty when you were yes, there. Yes, it was a lot of... The, it had been bombed, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, things were pretty messed up, papers all over everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then they, uh, we had an interpreter, and we went out into the communities and went out in the fields. <laughs> A little incident, uh, it might seem funny, but uh, uh, we went into this little house, and uh, uh, there was a uh, man and his wife, and, and the, it was... A, small place and had these woven mats and mm -hmm. then a little kind of a stepped up table like and uh, 
a man and his wife and he had two young daughters and uh, they were sitting around the table and the interpreter introduced us and we talked for a while. And as, as you came in the house, there was a little thing and I thought it was a butter churn. I remember these old butter churns mm -hmm. and, and I grabbed the handle and was jogging and up and down and, and they kept laughing and giggling and I asked the interpreter, what's so funny here? And he said, well, just a minute, and he talked to him and come to find out uh, it was a, a basket that had dirt in the bottom of it and they would put their human waste in that and that's what they would take out as fertilizer mm -hmm. on their field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they thought that was funny, mm -hmm. I was jogging that <laughs> thing. <laughs> was there any fear on the part of um, well, yourself in going among the population? No, they seemed to accept us pretty well. I know that in some of the larger cities like we went into Tokyo, they had these big compounds with people, and I talked with a, a, a Japanese man there that had worked for General Electric in the United States, and he was in the compound. Uh, it wasn't too heavily guarded, you know, they kept them inside this barrier. Uh, they were pretty content to stay there. I had uh, uh, no uh, hostility from any of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, we would go up through the towns in these little villages and uh, uh, the people were anxious. So I used to take uh, uh, little pound bags of sugar with me from the ship mm -hmm. because they didn't have any and I could, you could trade that for almost anything. Mm -hmm. I used to, ha I had a whole array of things I was going to bring back home and when we got back to the dock I set them down to talk to somebody and <laughs> Same problem I had when I first came in. <laughs> Somebody ran off with them. They had a little one thing that really intrigued me. They had these little cricket cages, and they had they would put crickets in them, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I'd say uh, gotten several of those that I was anxious to bring back. Mm -hmm. But uh, what was your impression of what Japan looked like when you got off the? You ship? know, I was really. Uh, first of all, shocked to think that they were so modern and had things so nice. We went into Tokyo, they had uh, uh, street or the pavement, and we went to a barber shop and got our first good haircut. <laughs> and uh, the, the sidewalks and that were all with little colored rock and stone. It was so beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, ceramics-like, uh, uh, well-paved streets, uh, had, had uh, street cars and that, that uh, uh, it was so modern, you know, mm -hmm. they had everything that you, but you, uh, for some reason or other, you didn't expect, or I didn't expect to uh, find things like that. Mm -hmm. And I was so shocked and so surprised that they were so advanced in their mm -hmm. culture. <laughs> what kind of uh, information were you given about the Japanese as a sailor? Well, uh, really nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, when you go into the military, all they do is teach you how to kill, but they mm -hmm. don't tell you how not to when you get out. Mm -hmm. uh, all the time, I can remember when we were going in, they gave us occupation money. Uh, each person aboard the ship got so much. In fact, I still have mine. Uh, so many yen that you could spend while you were there. Uh, they really, you know, they, you were mostly on your own. Uh, mm -hmm. You went over in a group and come back. Uh, so were you free then to travel around by yourself? No. Uh, well, one of the things that happened uh, uh, before they even signed the peace accord, they took people off the ships and put them in on what they called the occupation type duty and uh, gave them, uh, I don't know, I think they were M16s or something that you uh, really didn't even know how to use. And we just stood around and held those, but they, uh, we were waiting for the first cavalry. You know, mm -hmm. the war just ended in Europe and they were sending the troops and that there, and we had to wait for the first cavalry to come in to do the occupation. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we were sort of on standby for that. They landed them and finally they brought them in and then 
we all went back to our ships. How long were you on shore then in Japan? Not, I don't remember the time, not too long. Mm -hmm. We were just there for, we, you would go ashore for a, 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 a shift duty like, mm -hmm. maybe four or five hours and then you'd go back and then uh, you had a certain call time, you'd go back again. Mm -hmm. Now once that duty ended, where did your ship go? Uh, we uh, uh, did a lot of, of, uh, of inspection of the islands and the, and the uh, ports and that around the mainland of Japan and some of the little islands. Mm -hmm. And then they gave us uh, uh, our homeward bound pennant and we went back to, uh, picked up a couple other ships and escorted them back to uh, uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. Once you were back in the U.S. waters, then were you free to leave, or did your ship continue with other duties? No, uh, we we came back to uh, uh, San Diego, and uh, from there around to L.A., and then back through the canal and went over to Baltimore, Maryland, and made a port call there. And while we were in Baltimore, Maryland, I got to go home for 30 days, and I went home and got married, and that's where Janet's mother. <laughs> <laughs> but did you have to return then to your ship? You back only, to you the ship and okay. uh, went back to the ship and they sent me to Chicago in May. I think it was May the uh, 8th or something like that. I got piped off the ship, got on a, uh, they sent me by uh, train to Chicago, uh, discharged and back to Danville. Mm -hmm. Was being piped off the ship, was that a kind of ceremony? Well, it was a ceremony. Anytime you leave the ship, they have pipe, they have mm -hmm. boats and they do a piping, what they call a pipe mm -hmm. off and on the ship. Were the men on your ship recognized in some formal ceremony for their service? No, it's just like me. I went home on leave, come back, and they said bye. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what was it like to return to the civilian well, life? Well, I came back home, and uh, I had gotten married while I was home on that leave. Mm -hmm. And I only had three days, and we at that time you had to have uh, uh, a uh, lab treatment for your, you had to do a lot of blood work. And, and the thing was, I wasn't even old, I was only 20, and I wasn't of age. Mm. My wife was uh, 20, and the women were... 18, they were called of age, so mm -hmm. she could sign for herself. I could had to get my mother to sign for me. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, had there was a doctor in town who did the blood work. We took it to the lab and took it back, and then got the license and mm -hmm. uh, got married. And then I went back to the ship, and she stayed in Danville. So when you got to uh, return from Chicago, then what happened in your life? What did you do? Well. Uh, first of all, they had, you had, uh, uh, I think they called it uh, something in 10. They give, you had so much, uh, they would give you a monthly check for so many months. And mm -hmm. uh, I came back and looked around for a job and uh, uh, discovered that the uh, old railroad, Senior Railroad, where I had worked, was responsible to give me a job back. Mm -hmm. So I went back and uh, went to work as a uh, uh, labor on the railroad and uh, then took a, uh, got a job as a helper and then a helper apprenticeship and I learned a machinist trade. Mm -hmm. Now you had been interested as a result of your experiences in, on the ship in becoming involved in the civil rights movement. When did that come to the fore? When did you become uh, involved well, in community activity? Well, I went activity? To, after, uh, I worked at the, on a railroad till 1960, and then I transferred, uh, and there's, uh, it's a long story about how I transferred from the railroad to the government service because I saved a guy's job that worked for the government, and he was the machine shop foreman mm -hmm. at the, uh, on the VA and he said, if you ever want a job over here, come on over. So mm -hmm. I had decided I didn't want to work for the railroad anymore and he gave me the job and I went over and while I was there, I was assigned to a, uh, uh, I was a machinist, worked out of the machine shop and, but 
I was very interested in talking and working with the uh, people on the in the facility, and there weren't any blacks hardly. There, in fact, you didn't see any blacks in the VA facility. Mm. And uh, I got on a committee called the EEO Equal Employment Committee, mm -hmm. and uh, so we, uh, I. I met a social worker there who was also on the EO committee and a young black nursing assistant, his name was Charles Quarles. And uh, uh, we talked about, well, they need to hire more black people here, more black people on the, at the, uh, at that time, they didn't even have the uh, black historical. We got the first display there, uh, the, uh, 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 Birdzell was the director who, gave us a thousand dollars to spend uh, to put displays about uh, uh, people who had uh, uh, black historians. Mm -hmm. Now where was this that the, the displays were located? Where were the displays? Well we, got, we bought some display cases and put them in the lobby of the main building, the VA. Oh in the VA. Yes mm -hmm. and uh, and we talked with the uh, the personnel department tried to get them to uh, hire more black people. Uh, they finally started bringing them in and then they wouldn't hire them for a while because they said, well, they come and get a job and they get their first paycheck and they leave. They don't come to work for a few days. So we even started a committee to, uh, whenever they hired a black person, we would take them aside and teach them how to keep their jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, uh, the, uh, it became a thing all over the country. They were going to hire more black people. So Charles Quarles and I used to go around to the colleges and high schools and talk to the young people about making an application for jobs at the uh, VA. Mm -hmm. uh, then... Uh, uh, okay, we're, let's stop here for just a second. We're going to put in a new tape and we'll finish our conversation with the new tape. You were just talking about you and Charles Quarles went to various high schools and colleges right, and to, to encourage young Try to encourage young blacks to uh, make application for jobs on the, at the VA. Uh, our committee even wrote up a handbook that was used pretty well nationwide uh, one of the people, other people on the committee was Gene Vanderport, who was at that time a social worker at the VA. He, la he left there and later became the uh, uh, district leader for the EEA here in uh, Champaign-Urbana. He's the negotiator for all their school contracts here. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, uh, uh, I can remember one time they hired a uh, uh, personnel director for uh, personnel. Uh, uh, his name was Rollins something, and I can't remember his last name, but uh, after an EEO committee meeting, uh, or after, yeah, it was an EEO committee meeting, I asked him, Rollins, why don't you hire more black people here? And he said, well, let me tell you, Walfelt, with you, it's dedication. With me, it's a job. He said, I have to follow the whatever lines they give us. And mm -hmm. so that was one of the reasons they were pretty well restricted. In fact, we made such a fuss over it at one time, the uh, VA would not allow anyone on our committee to even talk to each other. Mm -hmm. We couldn't meet anywhere. We couldn't use any of the copy machines. And uh, we would meet at people's house, at each other's houses off mm -hmm. station. Uh, they wouldn't allow us to quit the committee. They told us if we did, it was considered a collateral duty. We'd be fired. And so uh, uh, while I was on that committee, one of the men who was uh, uh, a physical therapist at the station, his name was Fred Baker. He had graduated from Tuskegee, and I had worked with him in the uh, 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 football sessions in Danville, the Youth Football League. Mm -hmm. I'd met Fred and we'd worked together there. So he was on the uh, uh, Danville Human Relations Commission at that time and it had probably been in vogue about 12 years at that time. And he put my name up and Roland Craig, who was mayor, then appointed, asked me to become a member of it because of my work at the VA, which I did. And uh, 
Then when he lost his job the next year, Palmer became mayor. Uh, and we hired our first EEO uh, director. Uh, and uh, we did a search and we met this man from uh, uh, Chicago. His name was Phil, Philip Smith. At one time he had been the, uh, uh, had run the uh, uh, Coleman Young's uh, bid for mayor of mm -hmm. Detroit and got him elected. So he, he also worked very well in Chicago. His, his uh, family was involved in the uh, politics of the city. He had run for uh, uh, one of the jobs as an alderman in uh, Chicago. But he became our first EEO uh, chairman or uh, director in Danville. And um, while he was there, he was too political. At that time, it was a commission system yet, uh, the mayor and four commissioners. And when we hired him, our committee wrote the ordinance for his, for him to be the director. And we gave ourselves the hiring and firing rights so the city couldn't hire and fire him without mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. uh, so they did away with our commission to fire him. And uh, in fact, we got so upset, we formed the commission in exile and had it uh, on file with the state and uh, kept right on work and put out a newspaper in the city at that time, tried to ke keep us from uh, uh, publishing the newspaper. Well, we published it in Chicago. We printed it at, at uh, uh, Phil's house. And uh, then we, uh, uh, really got bad with him they, after firing Phil. Of course, he got a lawyer and later on won the suit against the city, the only one that the city ever had to pay for a year's service without having the service there. Mm. But uh, uh, he then went on to uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia. Uh, we uh, uh, kept things going in Danville. Uh, I, when I moved to Champaign, I, I got acquainted with a wear over here and I liked it so well, I sold everything and moved to Sha moved mm -hmm. to Urbana and Champaign. And I gave the commission to uh, a, f a young lady or a lady by the name of Gloria Thompson Brown. And she kept it up for a few years working with migrants and that. And there's another Habitat for Humanity here in, in uh, Champaign or Urbana. Uh, Tanya Parker, who runs that, was a uh, protege of of Gloria, so mm. all the oh things goodness. work, you know. It's fascinating. Uh, can, can I read a quote from your daughter, Jan? She oh, says right. that um, you never got to go to college, but when Jan brought home uh, her college textbooks, you would always study them and often would get more out of them than she did. So what, what was it you were studying in those textbooks? Well, I always wanted to be a teacher, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and books has always been important in our life. Even though I didn't get to go to high or college, I always did a lot of reading. And she would bring the books home. They were some that I hadn't seen or heard or knew about. Some of them were in psychology, and uh, uh, she went to a school in uh, called River Forest. It was a teacher's training. Mm -hmm. uh, college for the Missouri Senate Lutheran Church and uh, she would bring the books home and uh, after for each semester and man those things were something I <laughs> really latched on to and I would read them I'd stay up nights and mm -hmm. and uh, get everything I could out. I wanted to get my money's worth <laughs> <laughs> well looking back on your experiences in World War II, did they form your life in any way? Besides your work in as a community activist? Well, it was the civil rights movement that they really got me excited about. I was so hurt about the way those young black men were treated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was bound determined that I, uh, I couldn't believe that all people in the United States didn't have the same freedoms. 
Uh, and then back then, too, you'd go talk to some, even people in your own church, you know, you'd talk about the black community. They didn't even want to give them that they had hearts and minds and cares and worries and mm -hmm. feelings just like you had. They were looked at as a different type of a person. And it just, uh, you, it, 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 it just, it, well, our family was brought up. We always had an empty bed in our house or a place for a meal. If, if a child or someone got thrown out of their house or family, our house, when we grew up, there was always a place for them. Mm -hmm. So we always got used to having people around that you cared about and you mm -hmm. always cared about somebody. Thank you very, very much. I hated to go so rambly, but I. You didn't ramble at all. It's hard for me to remember a lot of that stuff.